Before I talk about the different sharpening systems that are available to us today and specifically the ones that I have in the shop, let me talk for a second about what it even means to sharpen a tool. There is a world of difference between the sharp and the characteristics of the edge on this axe, four pound Swedish axe, pretty sharp, and the sharpness on the edge of that little piece of obsidian. Now some people say that obsidian is the sharpest thing on the planet, I don't know. But there's even a big difference between the obsidian and the edge of that utility knife, which is also really sharp and a lot tougher than the obsidian. But the thing that makes these edges different fundamentally, besides the material itself, let's just talk about the two pieces of steel, is the angle. The angle that is ground onto the steel to achieve the sharp edge, the zero edge, the, the part of the edge that actually can be defined as sharp. In the case of this utility knife, I think it's about 15 degrees, you know, seven and a half on each side. In the case of this ax, it's about 40 degrees, about 20 degrees on each side. Essentially, a gentle wedge with a sharp edge. This has to cut while it withstands a blow. The blow would love to break the edge off, but it can't because it's gaining thickness fast enough that the strength of the material itself, which is increasing as the blow is transmitted back into the ax, is dissipated, is dealt with, is resisted by the strength of the material. This is not made to resist any blow at all. This is made to resist hand pressure in a direct, usually a slicing action. If you put any kind of a side load on a piece of a, on the end of a utility knife, what happens? It snaps off. When a knife gets dull, the very vanishing zero edge is worn back or bent back or turned into a thicker edge. The only way to reestablish that knife edge is to remove material, to grind material back the same amount on both sides until the zero edge, the knife edge, is reestablished. What that means is that you are removing, you are making your knife smaller using some method. Look at these two guys, okay? Those probably started out very similar in size because they are identical in purpose. This one's got a lot of miles on him. Probably came out of a butcher shop somewhere or a meat processing plant. This one probably came out of somebody's kitchen drawer where it's only sharpened, what, in my house twice a year? This was sharpened 30 times a day. And so in the act of removing the material to reestablish the knife edge, you are in fact grinding your knife away. Now that we know what we're talking about when we're talking about sharp, let's talk about some of the options that are available, some of the systems that you can get your hands on if you need to start worrying about how to sharpen a knife. The first of those is the one that I started out as a kid sharpening my knives on, and that is a whetstone. Now whet is an old word meaning sharpen. So a whetstone is, is strictly for sharpening knives, and nowadays, most of the whetstones you buy are man-made. Aluminum oxide, I think. Now, that's not as important as the concept that whetstones come in different grits. Just like the belt on a belt sander, you can get a coarser or a finer stone. When you approach a whetstone, as soon as you bring the knife in contact, you ought to be thinking about, what angle do I want? If I want a very, very acute angle, you lay that knife back down flat and be prepared to be there a long time because you've got more material to remove. If you want the knife to have a more durable edge, you stand it up a little straighter and you're gonna get it to that knife edge a little quicker. But whichever it is, it's kind of therapeutic. A water stone tends to be a little softer and will work up a little slurry. I mean, the water and the bits of the stone and the bits of the knife form kind of a paste. That speeds up the process. An oil stone is harder and needs the oil, frankly, to reduce the sound, to facilitate the back and forth and float the debris out, the debris out, not important. The bottom line is you start to get the feel of the angle. You can feel when the angle comes into contact with the stone and you start getting into the zen of a repetitive motion. One of the things you do, sooner rather than later, is to take your knife up off the stone and see what you've been doing. 
The act of pushing it across a whetstone will make the edge, the part you're filing or grinding, shiny. And you want that shiny strip to be about the same width. You want it to come clear to the edge of the blade. And that will tell you that if you keep doing what you're doing, you are actually going to be affecting the cutting edge of the knife. If you're too flat, it won't be touching the cutting edge and you'll clear, be clear back here. If you're too shallow, the width of the shiny strip is gonna show you that your angle is too abrupt. So if you've got a modern stone with two different grits and you've done all you feel like doing on the rough side, you think the blade is in shape, flip it over, get on the smooth side and polish it. Refine the edge, smooth it up and bring it up very close to its final sharpness. Now, if you've got a knife that is just totally wasted, if it's been abused, if it's been beat up, if the edge is out of shape, or if like this Bowie knife, it has never been sharpened, this is just the way it came out of the acid etch, there is nothing wrong with taking a file, which after all is just an aggressive way to remove material, and bringing the knife up to the bevel, to the shape, to the angle, that's appropriate for the knife. In this case, a little steeper than I would have on those skinning and boning knives. This stone is an Arkansas stone, actually mined out of the mountains in Arkansas, and it is, they are sort of reputed to be the finest whetstone outside of Japan that is readily available. This is an oil stone, at least I think it's an oil stone, which means that what you're doing is lubricating the stone. You're lubricating a stone that is already a very fine stone. Maybe, I don't know, really fine. But what I'm doing at this point is polishing the edge that was established on the rougher stone with the intention of changing it from a microscopic serrated, serrated edge to a microscopic smooth edge. You can while away a lot of hours like this. It's soothing and every once in a while you check it and let me tell you, it's sort of a relief when you realize all of a sudden, oh, that thing's sharp. I put this stone in a, in a wood, you know, plywood case. You do that so your fingers are away from the stone. You can clamp it down. It's worth doing that if you buy a nice stone and it doesn't already come in a wood holder. Make something to keep it in one spot so you can really bear down and not worry about it sliding or turning over. This is known as a steel or a honing steel, and it removes almost no material at all. It's for maintenance. You keep one in the kitchen, you keep one where you're cutting meat, and if the edge of your knife just sort of, if you lose a little bit of the edge, if the edge itself has gotten, you know, folded over just a little or, you know, what? It's not quite right, you can touch it up. You can kind of stand the edge back up and improve a knife that is dull-ish but not totally dull. You're gonna be disappointed if you ever pick up a really dull knife and work on this, because it won't solve that, but it'll keep a knife working better for a little longer. This is sort of a, an adaptation of this. This thing takes some practice. I mean, you feel like you could cut your fingers, and a butcher, a real meat cutter, can just really do that. I, so this is the same idea. You put your knife in there and you push it down, and you pull it through. And I have not used this enough to know if it's even a good idea. A better version of this, a modern adaptation, and I know I like it, is something like this. Now you've probably seen these. They come in all shapes and sizes and configurations with finger guards and big handles. And the idea is there are three carbide blades in here that are physically scraping the edge of your knife down. They're not grinding. They are scraping away in the way that some machining processes scrape away the edges of your knife down to that angle. It really works good. I like to hold this on the edge of a table so you don't end up slicing your fingers. And with just moderate pressure, you pull the knife down through those slots. And what happens is, you are physically scraping away the edges of your knife down to that angle. Can you see those little ribbons of steel? 
they have physically been scraped off the edge of that knife. See how it's clinging to the cutting edge right there? Now these tools will wear out a knife in a hurry. They're so much faster than a whetstone, but hey, they're faster than a whetstone. So the next class of sharpening systems is wonderful and dangerous. It is power sharpening systems. Electricity spinning a wheel of some kind that has some sort of an abrasive in contact with the wheel. In my shop, at least up until recently, what I was talking about was either a grindstone, a dry grindstone, or my 2x72 grinders, belt grinders. And frankly, that's really all I use because it's fast. But with the fast, with the speed, comes risk. There are at least two ways that a power sharpening system, dry sharpening system, can ruin your knife. The first way you can wreck your knife in seconds or fractions of a second is by ruining the profile of the blade. For instance, this knife, you may not be able to see that, was being used on a system that we just got that we're gonna show you in a minute. And was a little too much time was spent in the midsection of the blade until, uh-oh, not straight anymore. So now it doesn't come into uniform contact with the countertop. Now that can be fixed, but it happens so fast. So that's item number one. Be careful you don't change the straightness of your blade. The second profile exposure that you have when you use a power sharpening mechanism is ruining the point. For instance, this I think is about a $150 pocket knife. This is a nice pocket knife. It is so easy on a power sharpener to lose the tip of that thing. I mean, that comes to a very fine point. It's a very elegant taper. It fits into the case perfectly. And if you're not careful, what you're gonna have is a butter knife when you start putting this on a power grinder of any kind. So you've gotta go slow because irreparable damage can happen in the blink of an eye. Here's the next thing to be careful of. You've probably seen me temper blades as part of the heat treating process in here when I've made axes or knives, and if you haven't, you will. But heat treating is a very specific process that turns high carbon steel into something remarkable. The last step in heat treating is tempering. Here's the danger with any sort of a power sharpener, a dry power sharpener, and that is grinding is based on friction. Friction develops heat, and heat will take the temper right out of the edge of your knife, meaning it will soften the edge of your knife to where it will no longer hold an edge. The first clue you get that you've gotten that thing too hot is when you see a little bit of bronze or purple or blue color show up at the cutting edge. You've wrecked it. Here's how you avoid that. Keep dipping it in water. Keep it in water, like after every pass to the water. Every pass to the water. The second thing is, don't do this with gloves on. You've got to be able to keep your hand in contact with the blade at all times without cutting yourself to be sure that you've not overheated the blade and turned it into a conversation piece. Now there's another type of system that I've seen but I've never handled, and that is a miniature belt grinder. They just sit on your bench or on your table and they're narrow and they have jigs and the angles are set and they just work, they look like they work so good. But anything that has a spinning belt that has sand on it is going to raise the ugly possibility of hurting your knife in one of these two ways. Either you're going to ruin the profile and grind off the tip or you're going to stay on it too long and develop enough heat to wreck the temper. So practice, practice, practice. I've got one more knife sharpening system in the shop to show you. It's only in the shop because I had to go over and swipe it from Nate's place. He's had it for six months. I haven't played with it yet. It's a system that I think addresses every one of the shortcomings of all of the systems that I just showed you. The only downside is it's expensive, but you know, nothing's perfect. And these guys, the manufacturer, have loaned it to us, but I'll just let you know right now, boys, I'm not sending it back. I'll pay you for it, okay, but sorry, it's not leaving my shop, ever. So let me show you what this thing will do, as far as I know, and then in a few months, I'll be able to actually put it through its paces.
Well, here it is. This is a Tormek T8. I don't know much about it, but I'll tell you what I do know. It's a water-cooled, complete sharpening system. It comes with this really nice, heavy stone that's bathed in a water bath. It's got a leather strop attachment right next to it. It's got two boxes of jigs and attachments and accoutrements. It comes with what would have, what would have to be, I think, considered the, the knife sharpener's Bible, right? I mean, this will sharpen anything. And it's got the jig and the attachment to make sure that in the process of sharpening anything, you're sharpening it right. So how cool is that? Tormek, this is awesome. You know, let me know what I owe you, or at least we'll talk about how to how I can keep this in my shop with a clear conscience. Because I intend to learn how to use this. I've always sort of wondered, how do you sharpen scissors? How would you sharpen a gouge? Look at this, there's a picture on there of a gouge that's being sharpened essentially perfectly. I don't know, there's more information here than this old head is going to be able to hold on to, but, but I intend to give it a bit my best shot. I built this stand because next week I'm going to a hammer in up at size. I think every blacksmith in this part of the county is going to be up there having a good time. And they've all got a pocket knife and they all have an opinion about what it means to be sharp and how, what it is that means success and heat tempering. So I'm going to take this up there and those guys will play with it and they'll be intrigued by it and we'll have conversations about what part of this is vital and what part of this is just handy. So before we sign off on this, I want to talk to the dads out there. Dad, get your kid, boy or girl, a whetstone and a knife. I mean, how bad can they hurt themselves sitting at a table with a knife? They can't, but they can learn what it feels like to change the angle. They can learn what a wire edge is. They can learn how to use their hands to accomplish something worthwhile. And for the rest of their life, when they walk up to something to sharpen, whether it's a chainsaw or a wood chisel, they're gonna instinctively know how to get it at least sharpish because they learned how to get a pocket knife sharp. Thanks for watching Essential Craftsman. Keep up the good work. Clear that for the stuff that we're going in the house. There we go. So, but yeah, it's uh, perfect. The buildings we lost are all here. We can call them. Did you meet Ford's car? He said, This Myrtlewood radiates a sound that's just unbelievable. He goes, toy knife. Some, sometimes if I want it sharp, I'll come to this flat rock or a different flat rock. Just any flat rock will, will, will work. But I rub it back and forth on the rock and it gets it sharp. Sometimes I give it a point and that gets the knife kind of dull. And so then I sharpen the point. Let's see it. You can definitely tell that it's sharp. <laughs> definitely give some more scratch.